Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist. I hope you stand, please stand up and sing with us. We're going to start singing this morning with a familiar song. We've sung a few times already. It's called, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. Uh, so I hope that you'll sing it out with us as we worship this morning. Oh, the Blood of Jesus. It's real simple. It starts off with the words, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. His mercy is more. Just a reminder, whatever, whoever we are, whatever we do, God's mercy is always greater than that. His forgiveness can overcome that with us. So again, I hope you'll sing with us. We're going to start off with the words, praise the Lord. Sins, they are many, His mercy is 
sing it out, sing with us. Um, let God use us as we worship this morning with Jesus Messiah.
seated. Uh, I don't know about you, but I sure enjoy that. Amen. Uh, singing uh, to the Lord this morning. It's good to see you. I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful uh, week. Uh, man, it's been hot, hasn't it? It's been one hot summer, and I think tomorrow it's going to be hot again. Praise God. Um, but anyway, it's time to take up the offering. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, I mention it all the time. Uh, you don't have to look around or read much just to know what's going on uh, in the world with the economy and everything else. But you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his work keeps going on and on. Uh, hell is still hot, by the way. I'm going to be preaching about that this morning. Um, people still need to be reached. Uh, so the work of God needs to go forward. So let's continue to be faithful. Now more than ever, it's so important that every Christian, every person has a part uh, in the offering and keeping the work of God uh, going forward. And so let's pray and ask God uh, to meet our needs as he always does and ask God to bless the offering. Father, thank you so much how you meet our needs. And Lord, uh, even in spite of what's going on in our country, the economy, uh, Lord, you still care for us. You still meet our needs. And of course, that carries over into the local church and how you meet the needs of your church uh, through your people. And Lord, I'm so thankful uh, that the, the checks go out to the missionaries every month uh, because of the faithfulness of your people. And, and the work of God goes forward, uh, just like BBS and different things that we have going on because of the faithfulness of your people. And Lord, help us to continue to be faithful. Help every person to have their part in keeping the work of, work of God going on uh, here locally as well as around the world. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
appreciate that uh, very much. I want to preach a message this morning reminding us why we're here. I mean, why on this beautiful Sunday morning when you're off work, when you could be uh, home, relaxing, doing whatever, peddling in your yard, doing crafts, gardening, maybe sitting at breakfast right now, um, enjoying some eggs and potatoes and some some bread and all that kind of stuff. Uh, why? Why? Why do we take time and come to church? We just had vacation Bible school. I think Calvin just told me we spent about two thousand dollars. Frankly, that we didn't have, but we spent it. Um, why? Um, this week we're going to be setting up a tent for the first time ever at a local fair, and uh, Ryan wanted to do that. I'm all for it, by the way. Many of you have signed up. So uh, I went up to Nathan's shop, we got the banners, we got the invite cards, uh, went yesterday to Allentown, got, got some candy for the table and the different things and um, table covers. Uh, why? And here's the reason, Isaiah 5 and verse number 13, and if we don't remember this, um, it's to our shame if we don't remember this. Uh, it's going to hurt people in a great way. And if we don't remember this, ultimately, um, we're going to forget what this is all about. And we'll start just bickering and nitpicking each other and, and all kinds of things if we fail to remember what it's all about. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 13. The Bible says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Children of Israel were being punished because they forgot some things. And so we must not forget uh, these things that I'm going to be preaching about this morning. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Boy, this is a pretty bad situation right here as we read. And it says here in verse number 14, the end result of these things, when the people of God are famished and when the honorable men are famished and when the multitude is dried up and all these bad things, here's, here's the result of it. Verse number 14, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Hell has enlarged uh, herself. Luke chapter 16, a familiar story. I don't know how we can talk about the subject of hell without looking at Luke chapter number 16. If you look at that with me, verse number 19, there was a certain rich man. And by the way, this is not a parable. Maybe you've heard, heard teaching on that. Parables are earthly uh, stories with heavenly meanings. Parables never have names. When Jesus taught a parable, he would always say something like this, a certain man had two sons, a certain person, or certain. No, no names. You'll never find a parable where anybody's name is mentioned. So we see that this is not a parable. Uh, this is a true story of, of people. It says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple, and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and was buried. I want you to notice there's two men here. One of them has a name and one of them doesn't have a name. One has a name, why? Because he went to be with God. And his name was Lazarus. I always say this when I read Luke 16. Lazarus didn't go to heaven because he was poor and because he was destitute and God felt sorry for him. 
Nobody goes to heaven because God feels sorry for them. Nobody goes to heaven because they're poor and destitute and pitiful. There's no reason given in the Bible why somebody would go to heaven because of those things. But, you know, this man, Lazarus, he went to what's called Abraham's bosom. It's a place of heaven, a temporary place where people went. And, uh, and I'm not going to get into all that teaching about Abraham's bosom this morning. But it says here, the rich man died and was buried. I want you to notice the rich man didn't have a name. Uh, when people go to hell, they don't have a name. Uh, they're forgotten. Uh, and this rich man, and again, he didn't go to hell because he was rich. There's a lot of rich people in the Bible that go to heaven. Some of the greatest people that ever lived, like Abraham, was very, very wealthy. And we know he was God-fearing, and we know that he's with the Lord. But this rich man, uh, unfortunately, in verse number 23, it says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. I want you to notice that's a plural word. It has an S at the end. Uh, it wasn't just one torment. It was plural, many, many torments. And we're going to look at that in a little bit later. And he saw Abraham afar off. Then you know that might be one of the greatest torments of this place where they could look across and see Abraham's bosom and see the people that were comforted while they were in torment. And it says here in verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Hey, realize this. Those of you that may be going through a hard time, you may be suffering. You may be going a lot of things. One of these days, you're going to be comforted. And why is that? Because you know the comforter. You know God. And it says here, but you are comforted, and he's tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you will help us to remember this morning why we're here. Why we're not sitting in some restaurant or working in our garden, or doing some things that needs done. But we took a time out to come to church this morning. We just had vacation Bible school. We spent some money. We dirtied the carpets. We spent time. It was hot. We did all these things. Why? Because of what I'm preaching about this morning. This week, tomorrow, we're going to go set up a table. We're going to set up a tent. And we're going to stand there as the crowd walks by. We're going to try to get the gospel in their hands. Why are we doing it? Why? Lord, I, hope you'll, I, hope, I, I pray that you'll help us to see the why of what we do and why we do it. And we ask it all, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a place of heaven, a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom. There's a place of torment. I'm not going to study this morning with you Abraham's bosom, nor am I going to study actually hell. Three words that we find in the Bible for hell. One of them is Sheol, and one of them is Hades. Sheol and Hades are temporary abodes of the dead. Temporary places of punishment to one day... The Bible says God is going to call all people to heaven and there's going to be a great judgment. And after that judgment is over, the saved will stay with God in heaven where God is. And the lost will be thrown into a third name for hell, which is called Gehenna. Gehenna is eternal hell. Gehenna is where people go forever and forever and forever. God calls it the second death. God calls it the lake of fire. You see, Gehenna is, is a name uh, for the Valley of Hemon. If you study the Valley of Hemon in the Bible, you'll see that it's a garbage dump. And maybe you've heard preaching and teaching on this before. 
that it's a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where they took all the garbage. And one thing about this place that was constantly burning, it burned all the time, the Valley of Himnath. And it was burning and burning and they'd throw more garbage in and it was an everlasting fire and it never stopped burning. One thing about a garbage dump, it also has a bunch of maggots. It also has a bunch of worms there. And we're going to get to that in a minute where Jesus said the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. And so the Jews, as Jesus was teaching about hell, they knew about this place that never quit burning. They knew about this place that was filled with worms. And again, it's a place of everlasting punishment. I don't know about you, uh, but I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. And I know you don't want to go to hell. The average person doesn't want to go to hell. The Bible teaches that hell is a terrible, terrible place. We just read about it. The Bible says this rich man in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments with an S. <coughs> and he said, I'm tormented in this flame. What else does the Bible say about hell? Well, the Bible teaches the fact that hell will be outer darkness. The Bible teaches the fact that hell will be outer darkness. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I'm just going to go to hell and party with my buddies? You know, there's a song, I think it was ACDC, wrote a song called The Highway to Hell. And let's be honest, how many of you know that song, know of that song? You read the words of that song, and it's all about going to hell. And boy, there's no shame, no shame in it. I'm just going to, I'm on the highway to hell. I'm going to go there with all my buddies, and we're just going to, we're just going to party and have a good time. And they just boasted, I'm on the highway to hell. But let me tell you something. There ain't going to be no partying in hell. It's a place of outer darkness. Well, preacher, that's just your opinion. No, that's, that's what the Bible says. Let's look at Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a terrible place. You know, Jesus tried to help us as human beings. You know, I don't know about you, but I like having two eyes. How about you? Hey, some of you know the scripture that I'm going with this. I, I don't know about you, but it's pretty helpful to have two hands, you know, um, especially if you're right-handed. Uh, and most people are right-eye dominant. Most people are right-hand dominant. There's a few weird lefties in here, I know. And uh, But anyways, uh, let's see what it says in Mark chapter 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend you, cut it off. Wow, that's pretty graphic. That's pretty crazy. What's God expect us to do? Go around plucking out our eyeballs and, and, uh, and th these are the type of verses that the world would, would u use to mock the Bible. Um, uh, but God's not talking about poking our eyeballs out and cutting our, our hands off. What He is trying to do is show us how bad hell is and what a terrible place hell is. Cause we can relate with plucking out our eyes, you know. Uh, man, I don't want, I don't want to lose my eye or cut my hand off. It says here, if your hand offend you, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Think about that for a minute. I couldn't even imagine cutting off my own arm. Could you imagine that? Hell is worse than that. It's worse than cutting off your own hand. And having two hands to go into hell, into a fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know, the great gulf. There's no traveling between heaven and hell. That brings us to this. What is hell? It's an absolute eternal separation. From the presence of God. That's it. It's over. It says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8. In flaming fire. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Look at this here. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Eternally separated from God, having no name. Hell is a real place. It's real. He lifted up his eyes. It says in verse 23, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. It's a real place. By the way, Jesus, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. He mentioned hell more then he mentioned heaven. Many different scriptures. And of course this is one of the main stories that Jesus told. Not a parable again. But a story about a person that went to hell. And of course we read and Jesus taught. If your eye offends. We didn't even look at the other scripture about your eye plucking it out. But you know what? It's real. It's a terrible place. And as I already said, it's a place of outer darkness. As I already said, it's a place of eternal separation from God. Not only is hell a real place, but it's filled with real people. Let's not forget that. There's so much fantasy, you know. And I got to admit, I mean, I like the Star Wars movies. I like the fantasy movies, but we must not be lulled to sleep. We must realize there are some real places. Sometimes we're so infatuated with the make-believe. And I'm preaching to myself. We forget the real. Because part of the devil's wiles, part of his deception is trying to get us to live in a, a life of make-believe. That hell is a real place. Hell is filled with real people, just like this rich man. And this rich man, Jesus told this story about 2,000 years ago. I believe with all my heart, he's still in hell today. That's what the Bible says. And he's there. And one day, one day, he'll be resurrected. And he'll stand before God. And then he'll be thrown into Gehenna. Eternal hell. And there's a lot of people. Oh, my buddies are going there. I'm in a party. No. No. You're not going to be thinking about any partying in hell. That, again, that's a deception of the devil. People you know and people I know will populate hell. Hell wasn't made for men. I want you to understand that. Hell wasn't made for people. However, however, those who reject Jesus Christ as their personal Savior will go to hell. Jesus himself said that in John 14, 6. You won't see it on the screen, but Jesus said, I am the way, the way, the only way, the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? Truth was standing right in front of him, and he was blinded to it. Just like this world is blinded to Christ. I am the way, the truth. The life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the door. He's the door. There's one door, just like there was one door to that ark. One door on Noah's ark. And one day God shut that door and that was it. The door was shut. Nobody was going in, nobody was going out. And then the rains came. One door. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said this, if you try to get into heaven any other way, you're a thief and a robber. And let me tell you something. You're not going to break into hell, into heaven. 
And I can sneak in some back door. No, you might get there by the skin of your teeth, the Bible teaches. You might get there so as by fire, as the Bible teaches, but you ain't going to sneak into heaven. Hell wasn't made for men. However, those who reject Jesus will go there. Look at verse Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Jesus is talking about the final judgment. There's a group of people on the right hand. Jesus said to those people, enter into the joy of the Lord. They're saved people. They're not perfect people. They're really no better than the people on the left except for one difference. Jesus Christ. But to those on the left, Jesus is going to say, depart from me. And there's many, many scriptures about this. We see it in Matthew 7. Many will say to Jesus in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and this and this and this? And Jesus will say, depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. And here we have it. Again, a, separate, a different scripture. Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me. You cursed. Into everlasting fire. Prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was originally created by God for fallen angels. But then in Genesis chapter number 3, we had the fall of man. And because they decided to believe the creature more than the creator, man also will have his part in hell if they reject the creator. And that's sad. But I want us to understand hell was never made for man. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. And that's what God intended. But of course, he made us with a free will. So we can decide to follow the creator. Or we can decide to follow the creature. Say, ah, well, wait a minute. I, I'm not following the creature. Well, Jesus said, it's one or the other. Right? There's no, there's no middle in this. There's only heaven and hell. That's it. There's good and evil. That's it. Hell will be filled with re real people who simply said no to God. You say, preacher, what about those people in the, in the jungles, you know? You ever thought that? To be, be honest. What about those people? All I know is what the Bible teaches. Principles. Uh, verses. God said, draw nigh unto me. And what's God reciprocate? Do you remember in the Bible, uh, Ethiopian eunuch? And he wasn't saved. But he wanted to be. He even went all the way to Jerusalem to try to get some religion. You know what? He wasn't really satisfied because we see him leaving Jerusalem and we see him in the chariot still trying to figure it out. And folks, our world is full of people still trying to figure it out. Hey, you know what? I'm saved. I figured that out. But there's so much I'm still trying to figure out. Hello. Here was this Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip, by the way, was preaching revival in Samaria. And God said, Philip, Revival's over. I got a man down here that needs to be saved. So Philip left his revival, traveled down to Gaza, and he found this Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot reading the Bible. Do you know the introductory question that Philip used? Do you understand what you're reading? 
Do you understand what you're reading? And what was this Ethiopian eunuch's answer? How can I? Except some man should guide me. Do you know what the next scripture says, Fred? He got into his chariot and he preached unto him Jesus. He preached unto him Jesus. He didn't preach his opinion. He didn't preach his religion. He preached unto him Jesus. And the Bible tells us that that Ethiopian eunuch, he got saved that day. And he ended up getting baptized too, which is also good after you've been saved. But he got up into his chariot and he preached unto him, Jesus. He said yes to God. Unfortunately, we see stories in the Bible like the rich young ruler. That he walked away. Very doubtful that he ever got saved. We see John chapter 3, a man named Nicodemus. Very, very religious, but very, very lost. Nicodemus got saved. In Acts chapter number 10, we see another name of a very, very religious, but lost person. His name was Cornelius. He prayed to God always. He gave many, many, much alms to the people. He was good on the outside and he was good on the inside, but he was lost. And God said, you know what? You want to be saved? Do this. Here's what I'm saying. If people have a heart for God, God's going to make sure they hear. I believe that with all my heart. Doesn't matter where they are. I believe that with all my heart, they're without excuse. Because if they're searching, guess what? God's going to send somebody. My dad was searching. My dad knew religion. He did. He went to church as a boy all the time. He knew about God. But my dad started really searching. Man, I'm losing it. I'm losing my family. I'm losing everything. And God had a man at his work. That preached unto him what? Jesus. God knows where you are. God knows where that Ethiopian eunuch was. God knew where Cornelius was. Right? God knows where I was. Where my dad was. God knew where you were too when you got saved. But in every situation they have one thing in common. God needs man to reach man. God could have sent an angel to Gaza. God could have sent an angel to Cornelius' front porch. God hasn't chosen to do things that way. I'm getting ahead of myself in the message, but you know what Abraham told that rich man, as he cried out, they have Moses and the prophets. Your brothers, you want me to send somebody to reach them. Well, they have preachers that have the gospel. They have the word. And God left us the word. And Jesus is the word. Hell will be filled with real people. Here's the third thought. Hell contains real punishment. Some people, I understand it. I understand that they have a hard time with this. How can a loving God send people to such a terrible place? I mean, be real. Do you think hell is just this place with actual real fire and real, yeah. Yeah, because the Bible teaches that. Luke chapter 16, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, again, plural. 
A lot of torments. What are some of the torments of hell? We'll put them on the screen real quick here. Well, first of all, we've mentioned it many times, hell has an unquenchable fire. It's a fire that never goes out. It burns forever and forever and forever. I want you to notice this, hell is filled with memories and remorse. First thing Abraham said to this fellow was remember, remember, remember in your life. We're going to have memories of our lives. And hell, there's going to be an intense, unsatisfied thirst. Intense, unsatisfied thirst. One of the ways that people torture people is to keep water from them. Used to be called what we say the Chinese water torture. You know, drip, drip, you're thirsty. It's one of the greatest desires that we have is water. We can go a long, long time without food, some of us more than others. But you're not going to go very long without water. He said, let Lazarus come and dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm thirsty. Hell is filled with misery and obvious pain. It's filled with frustration and anger. As I mentioned already, it's the eternal separation from God. I could show you verses about that where their memory is erased from God. It's a place of undiluted wrath. The wrath of God. There's many scriptures about the wrath of God. Here's another thought about hell. hell. Hell guarantees permanence. Real permanence. Hell is permanent. People that die without Christ will most certainly go to hell. Why? Well, that's what the scripture teaches. Many scriptures we could look at. He that has the Son has life. Pretty, sim pretty simple, cut and dried. He that has the Son, capital S, has life. He that has not the Son has not life and the wrath of God abides on him. It's permanent. Look at verse 26 about that, about that great gulf. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us. Eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from people. Hell is not some things. And let's look at this little list here. Some things that hell is not. Hell is not total annihilation. Obviously, in a place of fire, your human body would be burned up. That's how people are cremated, obviously. But in your eternal state body, it's never going to be burned up. This man in hell still had a tongue. He still had eyes different things. So one thing hell is not is annihilation. Hell is not a temporary place of purging. There's a lot of religions that teach those type of things. But hell is not a temporary place where God just spanks you. No, hell is, hell is permanent. Hell is not the grave. People say that hell is the grave. 
People say that hell is right here on this earth. Have you heard that one? And boy, I, I get it. Some people really. I mean, I, I've talked to some people where I almost want to agree with them after I hear their story. But let me tell you something. This life, no matter how badly you have it, is not hell. Hell is so much, so much worse. Hell is not a parable, as I said at the beginning. This is not a parable. Hell is not a scare tactic. I'm not preaching this tonight as a scare tactic. I'm not preaching this tonight, oh, because we need more help uh, under the tent. No, the tent, the, the tent space is already full. If you want to help, see Ryan, you can help. I have pure motives. God knows my heart. I'm just trying to remind us as a local New Testament church, why are we doing what we're doing? Why? Because there's a hell. Well, I believe in heaven. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a heaven without a hell. We can't pick and choose what we're gonna what we're gonna believe. And then in closing, I touched on this already a little bit, but hell can be avoided. That's the best news of this sermon. Hell can be avoided. By the way, I'm not trying to scare anybody into being lost. But if you are lost, you need to get saved. But hell can be avoided through a promise. And God made us a promise. And, and Jesus tells us right here. And let's look at it. This rich man, he was concerned about his brothers. You know who's concerned the most about the lost today? Those that are in hell. Those are the ones that are the most concerned about the lost. And here this man, he was concerned about his brothers. Abraham, he says, send, send Lazarus to my, to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he might testify unto them, lest they also come to this place. Of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No. No, Father Abraham, but if somebody went from the dead, they, they will repent. Show them some miracle. Send somebody from the dead. Surely they'll repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will. They be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let me just remind us this morning, the word of God has the answer. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, you won't see it on the screen. It was a late edition. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What if they, what if they won't hear? What about this week when people say no? No. Well, maybe they already say praise God. Maybe they already have a church they go to. But there'll be many others say no. No. No, thanks. Keep this in mind. They're not rejecting you. Me. They're rejecting God. But what do we do? We're Moses and the prophets. That's who we are. Jesus said there's hope for your brothers. They have Moses and the prophets. The only hope people dying and going to hell have are Moses and the prophets.
That's us. Let's not forget it. What does the Bible tell us? Well, it tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What does the Bible tell us? Let's look at a few things. It tells us of God's love for sinners. Hell is so bad that God said, I got to save them. Even way back in Genesis 3 when they first ate the fruit, God had a purpose and a plan. I, I wish I could understand all of it. All I know is in the book of Revelation, it said Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. For God so loved the world. Why? Wow. I don't know. Sometimes I have a hard time loving people. Loving the world. But God... He loved the world. Why? Because hell is so bad. He sent Jesus to die so that we don't have to go to hell. As a matter of fact, Jesus was punished for me and you. As a matter of fact, hanging on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As most people believe, I believe that was because God the Father did this. Jesus became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus said, as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of that fish, so shall the Son of Man Spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Most people tend to believe that Jesus suffered hell in the heart of the earth. He suffered for you. He suffered for me. The Bible teaches us of a God that loves us. The Bible tells us of Christ's death to save them. And we're not going to have a New Testament. The book of Hebrews teaches this. For a New Testament, you need a testator. And you're not going to have a testator without death. In the Old Testament, we had the Old Covenant. And it was signified by death of all those animals. I don't know how many millions of animals. The New Testament, we have a New Covenant. A lamb. As John the Baptist said as he walked his cousin, by the way, by blood, flesh. Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the whole world. Whose shoelaces, I'm not even worthy to latch his shoelaces. The lamb. That's a new covenant. The Bible teaches about these things. The Bible tells us of Christ, not only his death, but his resurrection, his burial and his resurrection. By the way, we call that the gospel. That's the death, the burial, the resurrection. People have no hope without the gospel. Right? Uh, uh, Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Jesus is the first begotten from the dead. Jesus is the second Adam. Wow. The Bible tells us all this stuff. It tells of a God that will save anybody. Even somebody like Saul of Tarsus. Even somebody like Fred Kemp. Even somebody like my dad. Even somebody like me, just a little boy. Even somebody like you. Wow. Romans ten thirteen for whosoever. We have a whosoever God. 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Even a dying thief. Lord, remember me. Wow, that's quite a sinner's prayer, isn't it? We have our ideas, our own ideas, and requirements for sinner's prayers. How about that sinner's prayer? Lord, remember me. When you go to your kingdom, and Jesus said this day, you're going to be with me, what? In paradise. Here we have another one of those words again. Abraham's bosom. Paradise. They all end up at the same place. After the final resurrection. It's called heaven. For those that are saved. And then after that final resurrection. There's an eternal state of damnation. Revelation 22 calls it the second death, calls it the lake of fire. It's a place called hell. Let me ask you, where are you going? Where are you going? Number one, are you saved? Have you ever been born again? Do you have a spiritual birthday? You know, I have a physical birthday, November 28, 1963, Thanksgiving Day. I have a spiritual birthday, which is much, much bigger. Amen. December the 8th. December the 8th, 1974. A couple weeks before that, I turned 11 years old. What did I do? Well, I was sitting right about where Joe and John are. My cousin Billy and I walked up. And they took us in a little room. And I already knew. We'd been going to Sunday school for a while. I knew the story. I knew the story. But knowing the story ain't enough. Forgive that English. Knowing the story ain't enough. I had to put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. How about you? Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're a pretty religious guy. But even you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. I don't get it. How can I be born when I'm old? Can I enter the second time in my mother's womb? No, 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 Nicodemus. I'm not talking about a physical birth over again. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. A new birth. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, which is another's preaching message there. We should be different. Hey, Christian, how different are you after salvation? Very important. We've been given a great, great gift. What are you doing with it? 